This certainly isn't ideal, but I have contingencies. You can't trick me anymore. Edith, turn off the drones! Biometric scan complete. Welcome back, Peter. Shall I execute Just all cancellation protocols? Do it! Execute them all! Confirmed. Thank you. How could you do all of this? You'll see, Peter. People didn't believe. And nowadays, they don't believe anything. Is he... Is this real? All illusions are down, Peter. Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This is gonna be my Spider-Man Far From Home Sinister Six setup video. So clearly Sony wants to do a Sinister Six movie. They've been teasing it in Spider-Man Homecoming, now again during Spider-Man Far From Home. So we'll break it down, how Mysterio survived and what that Sinister Six movie is going to look like currently and their original plans for their Sinister Six spinoff franchise. There's a giveaway for the Spider-Man Far From Home Blu-ray. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave your best Sinister Six theory on the video. So obviously careful for spoilers for Spider-Man Far From Home. If you haven't seen it yet, we'll be talking about everything that happens during the movie, all the Easter eggs that point to Sinister Six. Starting with number 10. So you see, it seems like Mysterio orders the drones to turn off their proximity safety feature to fire on Spider-Man while he's at close range, inadvertently causing his own death via friendly fire. But the really important lines of dialogue that they both have are, they'll see what I want them to see, I have a contingency plan, People need to believe, and nowadays they'll believe anything. That phrasing will come back around in a second because number nine, Peter then asks Edith if he's really dead, but stops short of it and instead uses the careful phrasing, is this real? He doesn't actually ask, is Mysterio dead? Edith answers with the very carefully worded, all illusions are down. She does not say, yes, he's definitely dead. That leaves them a back door to bring him back in a future Sinister Six team up and say that they weren't lying. Like, oh, we didn't say that he was dead. We just said that all illusions were down. So eight, how was Mysterio actually able to trick Peter if his spidey sense was working in this moment and he could see through the regular digital illusions? First, you have to keep in mind that Mysterio is a genius. Even though he had all these funny lines of dialogue and silly moments with Peter, he was smart enough to earn a job, a high-level job, at Stark Industries next to Tony Stark before he revealed how unstable he was and got fired. He and his team of other super-intelligent, former, but unstable Stark Industries employees had been working on their contingencies for a long time when this moment happened. They weren't making their plan up as they went along. This was carefully thought out. And during the movie, once they learned Spider-Man had discovered what they were doing, number seven, Mysterio started planning for this moment during their final boss fight. He always knew that Spider-Man would eventually come and try to stop him. And the only way to beat Spider-Man's spidey sense when it was working at 100%, because he says, you can't trick me anymore, Peter finally using his physical senses to see past the digital illusions, was for Mysterio to play to his expectations and play on his emotions, his desire to believe in something. People need to believe. These days, people will believe anything. So when it seems like he's dying, it's a bit of a double meaning because he's playing to Peter's expectations. Like, oh, I've finally seen through his digital illusions, so he can't trick me anymore. So Peter's not looking for any kind of practical effects. That's why six Mysterio can use sleight of hand and old school trickery to fake his death. Peter was only looking for the illusions. So once it seemed like Mysterio actually got shot and he pounded his way through those illusions, he thought that everything he was seeing was real. And because of the carefully phrased dialogue from Edith, she said all illusions were down. He thought that what he was seeing was 100% real and Mysterio was 100% dead. But he wasn't thinking about the idea Mysterio might have had some other more practical way of faking his death, like using chemicals to slow his heart rate down and make it seem like he got shot with friendly fire and died. You never see what happens to his body after Nick Fury comes to collect it and you don't know that he comes to collect it. You just assume that he does because they jump forward in time. 
Talos even says that the basic low-level fakery that Mysterio was pulling during the movie was enough to fool him outright. He was so ashamed of himself, a shapeshifter, he should be a master at spotting stuff like that. But turns out Talos sucks at it, and in real life, it's actually possible to fake your own death by slowing your heart rate down so much so that you appear to be dead for a period of time. You can make up all the conspiracies you want about someone swapping bodies after Spider-Man leaves the scene of that crime. You don't see any kind of scene with him standing there waiting for Nick Fury to come collect the body before taking off. You just see him take off and go talk to MJ right after that. So there's a whole period of unaccounted for time with Mysterio's body lying there for them to swap in a different one to make it seem like he really did die. Five, even if you don't want to believe that Jake Gyllenhaal might come back for Sinister Six team up, there's William Ginter Reba, the understudy, who now has a chance to step into the limelight. Constantly put upon, even Mysterio didn't treat him that well, like he kept yelling at him when they were making those illusions. He understands Mysterio's technology just as much as Mysterio did and was there for every minute of his plan. He stole all of Mysterio's gear and data when he bolted right after that moment happened. The thumb drive itself just had the video that Mysterio and he had edited together framing Spider-Man. So Reba is the one that sent that video to J. Jonah Jameson in the Daily Bugle.net. But not only can he come back and make himself look like Mysterio with the illusion tech because all he needs is a motion capture suit, he can also use the illusion technology to make people think that he's the Quentin Beck version of Mysterio. He can make any kind of illusions that he wants. So either way, whether or not you think that he's dead or he survived in this moment here, they can still bring back Jake Gyllenhaal for Sinister Six. The reason why they wrote the ending to the movie this way, though, is one, to make it feel like a definitive ending, at least on the surface level, give Spider-Man his big victory. You can't trick me anymore. Big takedown of the villain. Two, because Jake Gyllenhaal isn't known for doing a ton of sequels, and Sony could always decide that they don't want to bring him back and just build themselves a backdoor to say, no, he was always supposed to die. We never planned on bringing him back, even though it was very ambiguous. And three, to leave themselves the logical backdoor to say that he faked it if they do want to bring him back because of tricky language that they use during these scenes. All illusions are down. Wait, what about him being dead though? I know the illusions are down, but is he really dead? Four, talking about the other Sinister Six Easter eggs. During the Spider-Man Homecoming post credit scene, Vulture runs into the Scorpion who's got that very mechanical looking scorpion-like bone brace while he heals from the fight. He says that he and a few friends are looking to find out who Spider-Man really is so they can kill him. Vulture did in the solid because Spider-Man saved him earlier in the film, but thanks to Mysterio and J. Jonah Jameson, the whole world knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man now. So enter Scorpion with the new version of the Shocker, Mysterio. They have Vulture to bring back if they want to. The Aaron Davis Prowler in Donald Glover's character, that makes five characters already. In three, right now it seems like Kraven the Hunter is going to be the main villain of Spider-Man 3, at least until we hear something different. It's just that around the premiere of the movie, the director kept talking about how he wanted to use Kraven in Spider-Man 3. Sony teasing Kraven during the Morbius movie, you see this on the side of the truck, so clearly Kraven's first cinematic appearance is imminent. That makes six characters that they can use in Spider-Man 4, but what about a much more powerful big bad to bring them together? A lot of you asking, where is Norman Osborn Green Goblin? Such a huge character, it feels weird for him not to be anywhere or any kind of Oscorp in Spider-Man movies. So you can introduce Norman Osborn in Spider-Man 4 as the Green Goblin, and you can still call it Sinister Six, even though technically that would make seven characters. There's always a chance for Michael Keaton Vulture or someone else to not come back, so it works either way. But two, yes, Venom could always be a Sinister Six team member. But here's the thing. That character is so big and popular on his own. I don't see why they would need to do that when they can just do Sinister Six and Spider-Man 4 and do a Spider-Man Venom team up in a totally different movie before Venom 3 happens. Or they could just save the first Spider-Man and Venom team up for Venom 3 Maximum Carnage. Venom should be its own thing separate from Sinister Six, and you've probably seen all the rumors about them doing even more Tom Holland films after Spider-Man 4. There was a rumor a long time ago about them doing nine total Tom Holland Spider-Man films, but it gives you a better picture for how Sony doesn't want to blow its wad in Spider-Man 4. So that's why Spider-Man 3 isn't going to be a full-blown Sinister Six movie, just a single villain maybe with a couple lesser ones leading up to a Sinister Six movie. And it's all because, number one, Sony still wants to make Sinister Six its own third Spider-Man spin-off franchise. So consider Venom a spin-off franchise of Spider-Man. Consider the Morbius movie another spin-off franchise. What are the biggest ideas, characters, and teams within the Spider-Man rights that they could do? Sinister Six is just the easiest slam dunk. 
is all about trilogies or quadrilogies in the case of the Tom Holland Spider-Man films because we know they're doing four Spider-Man films with him. Why do Sinister Six one and done in a Spider-Man movie when you can do three Sinister Six movies with a rotating roster of team members Thunderbolt style? This all goes back to Andrew Garfield era when Drew Goddard was originally going to start their Sinister Six franchise. He was going to do a Sinister Six movie that was set up during Amazing Spider-Man 2's post credit scene. The Sinister Six movie was not going to be Amazing Spider-Man 3. Amazing Spider-Man 3 was going to be a totally different plot line. Sinister Six was going to be a completely separate franchise. So everybody post your Sinister Six theories in the comments below. And obviously there's all this Venom crossover that we're talking about. That's completely separate from the Sinister Six stuff. I will do more Venom 2 videos in the next couple of weeks. I'll name a giveaway winner when I post my next Marvel video. There'll be a whole bunch more stuff coming up. Click here for my video about Quicksilver coming back during Doctor Strange 2. And click here for my brand new Rick and Morty Season 4 trailer. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I'll see you guys tonight.